So I'm delighted to be joined by Steve Roberts, co-founder of Mind Foundry and Chief Scientific Officer. Steve, thanks for thanks for joining me today. Just tell me about um, your experience in in this space of asset management. Yeah, firstly, thanks very much, Tom. Great to uh, great to have a chat with you about this. Um, asset management is one of those areas where the capricious combination of smart software and people makes a really big difference. Um, and we can't do good asset management with just one of those two things. We need somehow to combine deep domain expertise, which sits with people, and combine that with smart optimization, kind of on the fly data processing, and ways in which AI can look at this um, heterogeneous, noisy, dirty data from multiple modalities and pull it all together to produce a really good assessment of a situation present to a person who is a, an expert on the asset and the combination of the two just makes really good agile decisions. And I think that's an exciting space for human AI collaboration. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, you mentioned data a few times, you talked about dirty data. What's your experience with data and how that, and its role in supporting that decision-making? Um, I think like many people who work in um, trying to get machine learning and AI to work in the real world, uh, dirty data is absolutely everywhere. Uh, you know, you cannot move and nothing is clean. It's gappy. Sensors don't do what they should. They drop off. They're poorly calibrated. Uh, they lose synchronicity with other sensors and beyond. So the kind of things that we're particularly interested in, of course, are maybe more traditional telemetry that maybe comes from uh, structures, devices and uh, bits of engineering kit. But nowadays, uh, the the way in which we take data is much, much broader. So you can imagine having a, a camera. Um, a video taken by a drone, a snapshot taken by um, a human operative uh, looking at a particular asset. You could even imagine kind of esoteric things like hyperspectral imagery from satellites, um, seismic information from, say, trucks trundling over a bridge and a whole range of things. Then the problem is, well, I've got all this data, but it just all sits in a different space. And how do you pull all this together so that you extract big knowledge from big data? And we talk a lot about big data and lots of it, but we rarely talk about that problem of extracting big knowledge. And that's really where mine foundry asset management really wins big. So, so Steve, you've got over a decade of um, doing predictive maintenance uh, type techniques, and that, that was really the, the founding story of mine foundry. How how does that data turn into a decision support tool or, or, or kind of assistant? So, Tom, you you've touched on really important words. You know, it's uh, it's about decision support. It's not about decision autonomy or taking decisions away from the experts who are the people involved with this. But it's about providing that level of support. So I think there's several things. Firstly, you need to understand what is actually valuable to experts in the field to help them make best use of their own observations and their own recordings and maybe their own scribbled notes. Um, mm -hmm. Doing that is just one part of the picture and that's about that sort of human in the loop. But then it's about, as I mentioned previously, bringing together disparate pieces of information, no matter how scruffy and scrappy, bring them all together and kind of laying them on the table, if you like, trying to make sense of them, join them together. So you get a coherent picture, not just of what has been with an asset and what is right now, but most importantly, to be able to forecast and make predictions about where that asset might be moving in the future. That's really, really important because in a world in which we don't have the luxury of being able to maintain uh, absolutely everything as often as we would like, you have to prioritise and that prioritisation must be informed on the basis of evidence that comes from the data. And again, that's the kind of things algorithms are really good at doing in conjunction with people. And, and what do you how do you see um, from a from a user interaction perspective? What does this look and feel like physically for the asset engineer who's responsible for looking after 500 bridges? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, firstly, what it looks and feels like is making sure that you work with end users. Um, and I think that that's a first and foremost guiding principle. So, mm -hmm. Tom, all the work that you and the team have done on products such as Winwood have really put the user at the heart of everything that's done. And you go through trials of saying, is this a value to you? And of course, what's valuable um, to one person on one asset may not have the same value to another person on another asset. And I think that's yeah. another critical component. So um, I think that value is sort of an interplay, a real time dance between the user and the data collection and historic data. But again, that's something that algorithms are pretty good at doing. And the way, of course, we've always tackled that in MindFoundry is to say algorithms should consolidate data, but they should be honest and humble. Humble in that they are proposing solutions which may or not be right. So the human operative can select the right decisions and the right solutions and the right way to view and, and gather information. Um, but honest because they should be capable of taking that dirty data that we know is prevalent in engineering and making sure that they're honest in their appraisal of their uncertainties um, and so on. And I think modern AI does some magical things, but where it really fails is it's just not honest enough. It presents us with a solution that we scratch our head and go, is that really right? And only after several rounds of investigating, are you sure, does the AI backtrack and go, you're right, I'm not sure, I don't think I'm right <laughs> yeah, anymore. Yeah. So we just try and avoid that by being upfront, honest and humble. And that there's a load of nice kind of frameworks. And of course, we're, we're not shy of using the absolute cutting edge foundation approaches to AI um, if we have the luxury of large amounts of data. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. the asset maintenance, you just don't. And so we still build rich generative AI approaches, but they need to be uh, tempered by knowing that um, the statistics of uncertainty with small data sets is likely to come in. And again, that plays to the strengths of the noise of the world. If your world is deeply uncertain, you need to bake that uncertainty into every model you create um, until you have an overwhelming block of data, which is, is so rich in its knowledge that your uncertainty shrinks. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we always have that situation, but we rarely do in the engineering Absolutely. sector. Absolutely. And we, 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 start, we started by talking about dirty data and kind of the reality of notes and kind of all the scattered forms, centuries worth of written records about an asset. And I think I think the industry is waiting for that that chat GPT moment that kind of, oh, wow, it, it now exists and it's now here. Um, in your experience, what does that transition from a, a, a broadly analog way of working to to kind of an AI um, an AI enables um, work, you know, in, in industry? How does that how does that transition? How does that work? Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great question, Tom. And I, I don't think there's a kind of single catch all recipe for making that. But certainly in our experience, not just within Mind Foundry, but also in parallel projects within the university, it seems to happen in a um, actually a really kind of elegant symbiotic way uh, yeah. between the smart people who want the solution and the algorithms that you're trying to make smarter. Um, so. Um, and I would kind of pitch that in a way of saying there's sort of a wisdom, the wisdom of crowds, the wisdom of people who've who've looked at assets in the past and have made comments or given them as some kind of degradation rating or spoken about their maintenance requirements. This is all still incredibly valuable information, even if it's not kind of digitized in a modern sense. And of course, we can still use all of this. Yeah. We just need to aggregate it in a very, very smart way. And fortunately, um, you know, the mathematics of machine learning means that there are good ways of doing this. So even if, say, you and I go out and we we look at the same bit of kit and we uh, we give our scorings about its um, about its maintenance requirements, um, you and I are. Uh, let's say, hopefully self calibrated, but we maybe are not calibrated across the two of us. So we give different mm. ratings, even though over time, the trends, if you like, are going to be really similar. Then the question is, if you have lots and lots of these kind of records, are there ways in which you can combine them all so that you're extracting that wisdom from each individual, but you are anchoring it 
in a sort of a, a mutually calibrated way. And again, that's absolutely great. There are ways in which we can do that. So um, what you can then do is you start kind of as you build these algorithms, you can start folding in machine intelligence and then making sure that you're feeding back information about um, asset maintenance, uh, condition monitoring and maybe some predictive maintenance back to the people who are actually working in the field. And slowly the algorithms begin to get better and better. And they begin mm -hmm. to kind of mimic that deep domain knowledge that the people have got. And the people begin with that feedback to become better calibrated with one another. And, you know, we've got yeah. numerous examples across many different fields from um, literally from, you know, astronomy to finance, including things in predictive maintenance, whereby that sort of symbiotic feedback loop means that everybody given information begins mm -hmm. to self-calibrate much, much better. And I think the critical thing there is everybody tries to do the right thing, people and algorithms, but it's about the feedback of the right kind of information at the right time. And yep. as we all know, feedback always helps us better, get better, whether we're people or whether we're algorithms. And the trick in all these things is making sure the right kind of information gets fed back. Brilliant, Steve. I mean, that just resonates so strongly, I think, with our with our users that consistency is the is the key challenge that they have with all this data coming in and we, we sometimes badge it as subjectivity but 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 ultimately it's it's different people and and it creates noises and it averages yeah. out at a portfolio level that the, the big numbers average out so it works but at an individual asset level we don't really know what's going on so that's a wonderful insight about how we can self calibrate over time with with kind of this again human ai collaboration steve thank you so much is there anything else you want to add before we before we finish uh, i think i'd just add that um you know the the role of ai across its enormous breadth uh, all the way from sort of you know the statistical foundations right the way up to the very largest uh, vast um, models is really beginning to have an impact in real engineering and I think that um, you know one of the uh, one of the founding principles of Mind Foundry is that um, models should work on all data, whether small in amount or overwhelmingly large. And you know we've always stuck to that principle that you don't need zettabytes of data in order yeah. to build good models. Um, models are good on the basis of what they have available. And that means mm. that right now, even though the industry is beginning to digitize and transform the way it collects data, we can still use the valuable knowledge that comes from engineers um, who've been looking at assets and trying to keep them up for society for <laughs> decades and decades. So, you know, I, I think it's a, you know, a really nice time to be involved in um, the application of AI and engineering. Great. Well, look, really appreciate your insight and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Tom.